Hello, and thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I entitled this ta talk, Giving Manufacturing a New Life. Um, when we talk about giving something a new life, giving sailing boats a new life, we're normally talking metaphorically, of course. But I'm an engineer, so I don't do metaphor. Um, uh, I just do literal. And so when I talk about a new life, I mean a new life. But manufacturing, let's look at manufacturing. Um, here's a pie chart that you shouldn't believe. Um, I looked at global manuf annual manufacturing output, and I tried to quantify it into something physical. I mean, you can look up global manufacturing output in trillions of dollars, and you'll find lots of figures that pretty much agree with each other for, for that. But nowhere can you find it in a real physical quantity. Dollar, dollars aren't any. Dollars don't mean, they're just a concept. They're not something you can pick up. Well, you can notes, but you know what I mean. Um, whereas here, I was trying to look for tons. Uh, anyway, the best figure I could come up with, and as I say, don't believe this, uh, is these two. Uh, there's a big one, the blue part of the pie chart, which I've called P, and I'll explain what P means in a minute. Um, which is 5 times 10 to the 12 metric tons manufacturing. And then there's this tiny, tiny little orange sliver, um, which I call EP, which is a 1,000 times smaller. Now, what are P and what is EP? Well, they're these two. P uh, is living organisms, you, trees, and much more importantly, and on the right there, bacteria, um, they, of course, are the vast majority of things that get made in the world uh, every year. Uh, a thousand times more important than the other part. The P stands for phenotype, the biological concept, which we should come to in a moment. EP stands for extended phenotype, and that's objects like the ones in the bottom right, birds' nests. Birds' nests are made by birds. Cars, cars are made by people. EP is extended phenotype, and that is insignificant compared to the first type of manufacturing. Now, we know how both of these work. We're taught at school. The phenotype is the shape or the characteristics of a living organism, whether your eyes are brown, how tall you are. That, sort of, that is your phenotype. The color of the leaves of a tree, are they red or are they green? That's the tree's phenotype. And we know how phenotype manufacturing happens, the big blue part of that pie chart. It's by cells dividing. It's by self-replicating machines building themselves. Extended phenotype manufacturing, on the other hand, the little orange bit, and in that little orange bit, of course, is the whole of human manufacturing in the conventional sense. Everything you see around you that isn't a human being was made this way, um, is self-replicating machines not building themselves, but building things from stuff they find lying about. Birds build nests from twigs and leaves that they find lying about. People build motor cars from metal that they find lying about. Well, they find it in the form, of course, of metal oxides, uh, but they then refine it and turn it into motor cars. And this type of manufacturing is pretty insignificant. Um, how can we put the power of self-replication to make things into the hands of everyone? How can we move manufacturing into that big, human manufacturing, that is, into that big blue area of the pie chart? Well, I made a small contribution to this with which many of you will be familiar, which is the RepRap project, and I'm going to say a few words about that, but that's not the primary message that I want to bring to you this afternoon. I'll come to that a little bit later on. Uh, this is a picture of a RepRap machine, and there are many designs now out there. This is just one. Um, it's a partly self-replicating 3D printer. I say partly, it doesn't make every bit of itself. Uh, it makes about 50% of itself, if you count up the parts inside it. 50% um, is a reasonable fraction, uh, but uh, it doesn't sound that high. On the other hand, you've got to remember that you only make 60% of your cells. You might think you make 100%, but you don't. You're made from proteins. Proteins are made from amino acids. There are 20 amino acids. You make 12 of them. The other eight you have to get from elsewhere. So you make 60% of yourselves. RepRap makes 50% of itself. RepRap machine not only makes itself, it's rather like wheat or cows on the right there. They make themselves, 
but they also make something useful to us. Wheat makes flour, which makes bread. Cows make milk, and they make meat, and they make cheese, and so on. Um, their primary purpose in life, of course, is to make more cows and to make more wheat. And they're both very successful at doing that. And the reason cows and wheat are among the most successful biological species on Earth are is because they have a symbiotic relationship with the most powerful organism that has ever lived. That's the one sitting in those rows out there. What does RepRap make? Well, you've all seen outputs of 3D printers, so I just gathered a few together to show the diversity. Um, those are some objects that people have made and posted online. Quadcopter in the middle there, children's shoes, bottom right, and so on. Um, people often ask me, journalists particularly, what my favorite ever object made by a RepRap printer is, and this is the answer. Uh, RepRap has solved the housing shortage. Um, <laughs> Just, just not for people, unfortunately. Um, uh, this is a 3D printed shell which has been taken up by a hermit crab. Um, and uh, when I started the Rat Rat project, I had no idea that people were going to make homes for hermit crabs using it. That quite literally did not occur to me. But of course, the most important thing that a rep rap machine can make, in one sense, is another rep rap machine. And there's a picture, we've already seen this this morning, this picture. Um, I was going to say it was taken by me, but I'm in it. But of course, I took it with the time, time, time delay on the camera. Um, I took this picture in, on the 29th of May, four years ago, uh, sorry, eight, six years ago. Um, uh, the plus person on the right is Vic Oliver, who's another guy on the Rat Rat project from New Zealand. Um, the machine on the left is the very first Rat Rat machine 3D printer that we ever made. We made it, of course, using a commercial 3D printer, costing 40 odd thousand dollars. And the child machine on the right was the first complete copy that we've made of the machine on the left. And we put it all together on the 29th of May and started, and it didn't work. It failed. But the reason it failed was not because there was anything wrong with the parent machine. All that it had done was correct. Very stupidly, Vic Oliver and I had cut one of the drive belts in the machine too long. Um, and so we had to hold a screwdriver against it to make the whole thing work, to tension the belt. Then it worked. So the first thing we did when we discovered this fault was we designed a belt tensioner. We had the child machine print it while we held the screwdriver against the belt and then fitted it to the machine and it worked fine. So the first thing the child machine did was actually to make its own grandchild part and also to repair itself. And this is an important point. When you've got a self-replicating machine, you've also got a self-repairing machine, as long as it doesn't break too much or as long as you've got more than one of them. And of course, if you've got a self-replicating machine, it's quite easy to have more than one of them. OK. Uh, this is a quote from the London newspaper, The Guardian, um, which is a little bit, I think, over the top, but of course that doesn't stop me quoting it because somebody else said it, not me. Um, Rep Rap has been called the invention that will bring down global capitalism. Well, not yet. Uh, start a second industrial revolution. Mm, not really yet. And save the environment. Well, yeah, that's what they said. Um, but let's just look at that environment thing a minute, because it gives us a little bit of a clue, something that might be rather important. Um, you can do the calculations quite easily and show that when you're running a rat rat machine, down at the power station, where they're burning oil or gas or whatever, it'll emit, on average, about eight grams of carbon up the power station smokestack every hour. But the rat rat machine, is laying down 25 grams of carbon every hour. That carbon, of course, is in the plastic that the 3D printer that it is, is printing with. So it's laying down more carbon than it's emitting as it runs. What that means is that if you use a plastic which is based on plants, all that carbon, of course, must have come out of the atmosphere. And so you're saving about 15 grams of carbon every hour that you run the machine. Every hour that you run the machine, you're emitting eight grams of carbon, maybe 10, and you're laying down 25 grams that used to be carbon in the air. You're taking carbon out of the air by running the machine. There is a plastic that's made from plants. It's called polylactic acid. And it, by pure chance, 
turns out to be one of the very best plastics for use in the process that the RepRap machine uses. So we can, if you can grow a starch crop, corn, potatoes, or any other plant that makes starch, and many, many plants make starch, then you can actually run your machine, and all the time you're running it, you can be taking carbon dioxide out of the air. That doesn't, of course, include the carbon that was emitted into the air to make the parts of the machine that are not plastic to start off with. But the longer you run the machine, the less and less significant that initial carbon becomes. So the lesson from this is straightforward. We need to make junk, and we need to make lots of it in order to save the environment. If you want to save the environment, you have to bring to bear on the problem the single biggest force in the, in the world. And of course, the single biggest force in the world is human greed and stupidity. If you can get human greed and stupidity aligned with the problem of saving the environment, then you're onto a winner. So what we need to do is not just rep wrap, but encourage people to use biologically sourced plastics in their 3D printers and to print as much junk as, now people love junk. You've only got to look online to see that. Um, people love junk. And if we can get them creating as much junk, therefore locking up as much atmospheric carbon as possible in things that they leave around their homes, then we're doing a good job. OK. Well, the environment, of course, is something where living organisms grow. And those are the living organisms I showed you in that big blue area of the pie chart at the start. Um, another question I often get asked is how I came up with the idea of rep wrap. And this is the answer. Uh, I didn't want to make a 3D printer at all. I wanted to make a self-replicating machine. When my university acquired a conventional and very expensive 3D printer, that $40,000 machine that I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, when my university acquired that, I suddenly realized that for the first time, humanity had a manufacturing technology that was sufficiently powerful that it stood a chance of copying itself. But I knew that if I wanted to make a self-copying machine, it had to be stable in the same way that living organisms, if they survive and don't go extinct, are stable. And what evolutionary biologists call a stable system in biology is, it exhibits a thing called an evolutionarily stable strategy. And this is a piece of evolutionary game theory that I won't bother to explain now. But one example of it is the symbiosis that we all learn about in school, the symbiosis between the insects and the flowering plants. And as I say, we learn about this in school. We all know how it works. Uh, the insects uh, have no interest in plants, except for the fact that the plants attract the insects to them. Why do the plants attract the insects to them? Well, the plants need to move their pollen. The plants can't move. They're rooted in the ground. So they need something that will move their pollen for them. So the plants make nectar, and the insects visit the plants for the nectar. And in so, doing so, they inadvertently transfer the pollen from one plant to the next. The plants are happy, they get to reproduce. The insects are happy, they get a meal. Everybody's happy, everybody benefits from this relationship. Uh, and it evolved 140 million years ago in the late Jurassic, and it's been going from strength to strength ever since. RetRat was designed to exploit exactly the same mechanism, except with a different living organism than insects. The RetRat machine is like the flowers. It can't completely reproduce itself. It doesn't make all of its own parts, just as you don't, but also it doesn't put itself together. Human hands are really good at putting things together. And so RepRap needs to persuade human beings to put it together, just as the plants need to persuade the insects to visit them. How does RepRap do that? Well, the answer is it doesn't just make copies of itself. It'll make all sorts of other goods as well. And those goods are the equivalent of the nectar that the plant makes to attract the insects. People make rep wrap machines not because they want more rep wrap machines. People make rep wrap machines because they want to make other stuff, much of that junk that I was talking about just now. Notice that there's no money involved in that. That's an inherently stable system that will work for people, whether there were dollars or euros or pounds or yen or whatever or not. There's no money. That works at a higher level than money. It works at a level of demand and supply and gratification, biological things, not mere economic things. OK, let me move on a little bit and look at the arrow of time and the way in which things progress as history 
unfolds, and particularly the way in which manufacturing progresses. Now, we all know what's going on on the left-hand side there. We've all seen this sort of activity before. It's essentially medieval manufacturing. It's a blacksmith's forge, and there's the blacksmith or two blacksmiths making horseshoes. Possibly they'd also make hinges for farm gates and so on. This was a local activity. It was, had a very narrow geographical range. Its customers were local. It worked with, almost invariably just with people the blacksmith happened to know. With the Industrial Revolution that changed, people discovered economies of scale. The picture on the right is a 19th century iron foundry, uh, which is doing more or less the same thing that the blacksmith on the left is doing, but it's doing it much more efficiently. If it had to make horseshoes, and it made many other things, but if it had to make horseshoes, the iron foundry would be able to do that more cheaply than the blacksmith. Why? Because of economies of scale. All of that manufacturing ability had been put in one place, so it was much bigger, but also human speciality could come to bear. There was a person in that place that was involved in marketing, another person in that place that was involved in uh, hiring and firing people and so on. All those specialisms could be integrated together to make a much more efficient system than the blacksmith having to fill out his own tax returns. But the arrow of time doesn't always go that way. Economies of scale don't always expand. They don't always get bigger. Here's some examples of where it goes the other direction. Our great-grandparents and our grandparents used to parcel up all their dirty clothes and send them off to a laundry somewhere in the town. And they'd come back three days later, clean, possibly even ironed, uh, in another parcel. And they'd pay to have this service done for them. Now, none of us do that. And the reason none of us do that is because we all have a robot in our kitchens that does our laundry for us. Um, we've actually broken that economy of scale, the centralized laundry, and brought it back into our own control. The washing machine has a very important characteristic after its most important, its most important characteristic is that it washes your clothes. Its next most important characteristic is that it spends 90% of its time idle. You're quite happy to invest money in that robot and to have it sit in your kitchen idle for 90% of the time, even though you put money into it because of the convenience it gives you the other 10% of the time when you want some clean clothes. Also, it's a much more robust system. If the central laundry in town, its water supply breaks, then nobody gets their clothes clean for a week. If your washing machine breaks, you can go to your neighbor and say, can I wash my clothes until my washing machine's fixed? And you maybe have to go for half a day without clean clothes, and that's it. The distributed system is much more robust than the centralized system. Something else that's happening in the lower pictures, the electricity for here is almost certainly being generated by something in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, a centralized two or three gigawatt power station. But of course, now we're all getting our own power stations. Admittedly, it's not quite 100% economically sustainable at the moment in that it has to be, government suffer, uh, has to be uh, the benefit of certain government subsidies, but people are starting to generate our own, electricity, our own electricity. And the cost, of course, of solar panels has fallen by 90% in the last 10 years. So it's getting more and more affordable all the time. That's another example of the economy of scale being broken when the technology gets cheap enough, like the washing machine, and the technology gets easy enough for people to manage for themselves, again, like the washing machine or indeed the solar power system. The previous pie chart I showed you may be a little bit inaccurate because it was very difficult to get the figures. This one is spot on. This one is real peer-reviewed research by MIT. Uh, they did an examination of the annual UK research and development spend on consumer products. By consumer products, we mean things like toothbrushes and motor cars and bicycles, obviously not things like bridges uh, and buildings and so on. So consumer products, the UK spends 5.5 billion annually on R&D. And that falls into another pie chart with two sections, a blue and an orange one. Uh, 2.3 billion of it is the blue bit, and 3.2 billion, the larger bit, is the orange bit. What, are the, what is the distinction there? Well, it's a surprising one. It's this. Industry spends 2.3 billion in the UK on consumer research and development. 
private individuals effectively spend 3.2 billion. Now, this is trivial things, like people buying wood and using it to put up shelves in their homes. It's slightly more advanced things, like people using their home workshop. Very few have them, but some do, to make new and innovative products. But if you add it all up, the fact that there are 60 million people involved uh, means that private individuals actually spend more than industry on R&D into consumer products. And that means that today, there is enormous market for moving consumer product R&D and also manufacturing implicitly out into the community and away from industry. And that's today, let alone in 10 years' time. Well, what of 10 years' time? What of the future? Um, today, everyone has, you all have your own CD pressing plant. You all have your own photographic lab and printing press. Of course, they don't look like these traditional versions of those items. They're the laptop that you have in front of you. Uh, given that you've got all of those things, uh, why shouldn't you have your own factory? And if you're going to have your own factory, let's make it a factory that makes more factories. Then you can give your friend a factory. And this is the central message that I really want to get across this afternoon. Everybody here is one way or another involved in open hardware. Hardware means making things. If you're going to make a machine that makes things, you naturally would start by saying, what does this need to make? How is it going to achieve it? I want to try and persuade you not to do that. I want to, you to say to yourself, I'm going to make a machine that makes things. I know what I want it to make, but I'm going to forget about that for the moment. How am I going to make this machine make itself? Solve that problem, and then look at how the solution that you've created will make the object that you originally intended to make, and you will have made something that can be distributed to everyone because it'll copy itself, at least in part, like the rep rat machine. Okay, that's all I have to say. Um, if you want to know more, point your phones at that. Thank you very much indeed.